Hello, welcome to Memo Conversations. I'm video producer Osman Butt. We tend to remember the period between 1945 to 1991 as being the Cold War, where the world was divided between two powerful nations, the United States and the Soviet Union, battling for dominance and ideological victory. But there was a parallel world order legally made up of developing, largely made up of developing nations and ex-colonies called the Non-Alignment Bloc, founded in Belgrade in 1961 and consisting of 120 countries, initially unified by the goal of both development and to remain outside the orbit of both superpowers. The former Yugoslavia was pivotal to this movement. So much so, during the battle for independence, Algeria's FLN asked Marshal Joseph Tito to send aid. One of the pieces of aid Tito sent was a filmmaker who came to Algeria to document the struggles of the independence against the French, of whom had almost exclusive access to filmmaking equipment and was enabled, and this enabled Paris to push its own perspective on what was happening in the North African country. A new film, uh, Cinema Guerrilla's Non-Alignment, Scenes from Labudovic's Reels, follows the journey of Stefan, Stefan Labudovic, um, Tito's favourite cameraman, um, who went out of his, uh, to Algeria to capture the Revolutionary War on film. Joining us to discuss this uh, maker, uh, joining us to discuss this is the maker of the film, Mila Turajilic. Turajilic? Is that how you pronounce your name? Sorry. Turajilic. Turajilic. Uh, I always do this, so it's like a fa- favourite for my audience as I mispronounce everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't worry. Um, so Mino Turajic was born in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, in an award uh, and is an award-winning filmmaker and archive archivist whose works include Cinema Communist in 2010 and the IDFA winning the other side of everything her most um her most documentary dips uh diptych non-alignment and cinema gorillic uh scenes from the budovich's reels this is her latest film the one we're discussing today um and archive road trips through both the third world was described by the New York Times as a visual in is a visually interesting inquiry into what his takes to envisage a new world. Uh, in 2018, Mila was commissioned by the MOMA New York to create video installations for their landmark exhibition on Yugoslavia modernist architecture. She is the founder of the New Aligned Newsreel Research Project, non, uh, non-alignment uh, reels.com, an artistic exploration of the orphan status of the film archive made in Yugoslavia in gesture of cine solidarity, which is with the non-alignment world. Performative and video iterations of the project were curated for the IDFA on stage, international exhibitions and biannuals, Berlin 22, Belgrade 22, Sharjah 25. In 2020, Mila was invited to join the AMPAS Oscar documentary branch. She was named the Chevalier des Arts and Arts and Letters by the French government in 2022. Mila, thank you for joining us at Memo Conversations. Thank you for having me. And apologies for all the uh, mispronunciations <laughs> there. Uh, my audience loves it, though. Uh, <laughs> So I wonder if we could sort of start right at the beginning, um, just sort of get people used to you. Could you perhaps tell us, you know, what got you into, were interested in making films and documentaries to sort of begin with? So I studied political science and international relations at the London School of Economics and in parallel was studying film production at the National Film School in Belgrade because for... Most of my kind of formative years, I I was torn between this interest in cinema and this passion for politics. And then I was quite active in the student movement towards the end of the 90s against uh, Slobodan Milosevic and, and kind of nationalist policies that were led by his regime. And um, was 21 years old when we had a revolution, essentially, and um, regime change, if you like. And 
the kind of disappointment that followed that moment, which was definitely a highlight of, of, of my political life, but also my life, was so profound in many ways that it, I left political activism and was really searching for another language, uh, one that I would have more faith in, um, in terms of how I would engage with the world. And I kind of ended up, uh, or documentary cinema found me, maybe rather than ended up finding documentary cinema. But uh, in 2003, I got a scholarship from the French government to do a specialization in documentary cinema at uh, La Femis, the French National Film School. And from there, it just became a pretty obvious path for me. Interesting. So when you talk about um, you, so before we sort of go into your documentary life, you talk about obviously being an activist. And in fact, I think in one of your films, The Other Side of Everything, you do document, it comes from your family as well. Your mother was an activist. Before we sort of get to that particular film, which I want to discuss a little bit as well, um, sort of describe to us then, you talk about this disappointment. What was it you were, what drove you to want to be involved in these protests to begin with? And what were you sort of expecting? What, what is this disappointment you're describing? Why were you disappointed? I mean, well, on one hand, it, Milosevic left. Yes, for sure. And um, I, <laughs> it's a great question. I Where the activism comes from, definitely because politics was, you know, the language spoken in my family. and uh, Everything was highly political and everyone was highly politicized. And my mother was really uh, a kind of very visible public figure in her activism. So it was just something that you kind of, you know, I'm due at the dinner table. Um, for me, I think, you know, there is, it's maybe easier to be in a position where you're protesting against something than to be in the position where you're given the reins and now it's your turn to, to build. And so, you know, it's funny because I, I think I only realized how embittered I had been by the disappointment that followed. You know, building, I, I think building democracy was something I hadn't really anticipated would be so complicated, would require so much compromise and ultimately so many frustrating half measures, you know. Um, I guess my big realization following the revolution was that while, you know, the majority of the population of Serbia had ultimately united against Milosevic and his policies, that didn't actually mean that we were united in the vision of the Serbia we wanted to create afterwards. And I think that was the real awakening for me. And it's interesting because... In 2013, no, 2012, I think, you, you'll correct me. I happened to be in Cairo uh, during the first weekend, the weekend um, of the first presidential elections after Tahrir Square. And I remember kind of going to Tahrir Square, very curious what kind of energy I would find there and finding the exact same energy that I had lived through in 2000 in Belgrade, the kind of euphoria of a moment of political achievement, of a moment of a coming together, where you kind of really realize that people have united and moved towards, you know, a kind of political vision. And I remember standing there in Tahrir Square thinking, you guys have no idea. <laughs> I really feeling like someone coming from the future, uh, really disconnected in some ways, thinking you have no idea that this is going to be the highlight of your life and that everything that follows this is going to be a huge disappointment. And I think that's when it really hit home to me how embittered I'd become by, you know, that experience in Serbia. It's uh, interesting you would say that, actually. I mean, I was listening to a podcast, um, another podcast, where there were a group of Arab Spring activists from Egypt and elsewhere, and they were talking about their disappointments um, with the revolutions. And they actually used to go and train in Serbia or with a Serbian activist, Popovic, who's very well known internationally as somebody who sort of trains a lot of activists and works on them all over the world. Um, and he sort of, they sort of said they thought that because they, from their point of view, the revolutions were in effect failures because they ended up with something a lot worse. They didn't get the sort of promised changes. They sort of said felt very depressed and stuff. And they asked Popovich about this because to their mind, Popovich represents a successful person who was successful in revolution. And he sort of said to them, well, you know what happened to a lot of my friends after the revolution in Serbia? A lot of them committed suicide because after the sort of high of the revolution and the sense of success, there was nothing else in life that they could go back to that felt, you know, that met that sort of high, but also as you said, the, complex, uh, the complexity of what comes next was a much larger challenge than they sort of realised. 
So there's a kind of parallel there in that sense. Yeah, there is a huge parallel. And and that's a really complex and fascinating story, you know, the way those tactics and strategies that had been developed prior to Serbia, even in Burma, and then were applied successfully in Serbia, went on, you know, to be applied elsewhere in, in very different, and I would say un, a non-comparable context, which I think makes that story really complicated. But it's kind of interesting when you think about it, because uh, if you think about this, it's sort of continuation of the Yugoslav legacy of helping other revolutions elsewhere, but albeit in a slightly different way. That's interesting. I've never, I've never drawn that. I've never drawn that through line. It's a very interesting way of looking at it. Well, I've only just made the connection now myself because I thought, hang on a minute, Popovich, and then back in the sixties, you had the state uh, Tito doing that. So I thought, hang on a minute, there is actually a history of this. Um, so, but because uh, you also, you mean, partly you sort of try to think through your disappointments with the film, uh, The Other Side of Everything, which, as I mentioned a moment ago, and featured your mother, who was quite a prominent activist. Um, and I sort of wonder sometimes when you have someone like that, when you're sort of living in that, whether you feel like you're sort of also living in their shadow or whether you feel like you're able to continue the achievements that they, uh, you know, did. It was neither. It was, um, you know, the fact that my, my, you know, the Yugoslav wars began when I was 11 years old. And by the time I was 13, you know, the protests against Milosevic had, were really underway in Serbia, which is not something most people are aware of. The Western media didn't really report on that much. Uh, and, you know, I, I kind of would cut classes in school and to go see the students demonstrating. I was 13 maybe, and I ran into my mother at the head of the demonstration. You know, it was just one of those things that I took it so for granted that this is what my mother is, that it's only when I hit my thirties and began to face my own questions of, will I engage, you know, will I become involved in shaping the society that I'm living in, that I began to realize that my mother had made an active choice in doing that, that it wasn't just a given that that's what my mother does. And I really began to fundamentally examine where her conviction and courage to do something like that had come from. So, no, for me, it was more, a, you know, a reckoning that came when I was in my 30s that whatever it was that she had, I didn't have. I didn't have that courage of conviction um, to step in or to step up like that and to speak out like that. So the other side of everything was my cinematic way of reckoning with that. Yes, indeed. And it's also, I mean, it's a generational story. I mean, it's kind of funny when you say you turned up and your mother was just there and you ran into her and you were like, oh, this is normal. And a lot of people, young people especially, if they turn up to a party and their mother's there, they'll be very alarmed. <laughs> but, uh, but this is, seems like a very sort of normal thing. But in that film, The Other Side of Everything, you were talking a lot about, because you're trying to make sense, I got the impression of your own sort of sense of disappointment and what happened afterwards. But you wanted to also tell in a very novelistic kind of fashion with documentary, um, the idea of you know intergenerationalism and looking at the perspectives on the revolution through these different generations in the sense that, you know, you feel disappointed, but your mother looks at it quite differently. Yeah, it's funny because by the end of the film, you realise that, you know, she's the optimist and I'm the pessimist, which is not how it should be going. Uh, you know, it's not the younger generation that should be the pessimist. But I love the fact that you're bringing generation into the conversation because I find that a lot of the work I've been doing has really been about intergenerational transmission. You know, how do we get these stories to transmit? And and in the other side of everything, it really ultimately come, becomes a film about this kind of in heritage, you know. Uh, because the film is situated in our family apartment, a lot of it plays out through this idea of objects that get inherited. But the kind of underlying current of the film is what do you do with this material, with this moral heritage that, you know, you are now given, there's a moment in the film where she says, I'm too old, it's time for someone in your generation to speak up. So you're, you know, there's this kind of moral heritage of resistance, of speaking out, of taking responsibility that you're being, you know, kind of offered your turn. What do we as a generation do with that? Indeed, indeed. And I was actually also wondering then, because, um, Obviously, you have this revolution, and that shapes the way you think about Serbia um, specifically. But when your mother would have been growing up, it was obviously Yugoslavia, a very different kind of culture, a very different kind of place. Um, so how did, for example, doing things like this change your perspective on the history of the country you come from? Oh, it changed dramatically because, you know, I grew up in a family 
it's a very rare position that had a very rare position, which is that my grandparents and even great grandparents were profoundly pro Yugoslav, but my grandparents were anti socialist. And most people can't quite square that because they seem they, they think of Yugoslavia as a socialist creation, um, but it wasn't. It preceded the, the the socialist era. My grandparents were social democrats, but they were not social. And so I grew up with a narrative that was fully kind of in, included um, all of the repressive elements of what Tito's Yugoslavia had been. You know, the kind of shutdown on political liberties and freedoms. I, I, I grew up imbued in those stories. So for me, when I started working on the, the question of Tito's Yugoslavia, I was coming from a very skeptical point of view, a curious one, because, you know, I, I, I was 11 when the war began. I did begin elementary school as Tito's pioneer, and my parents let me be in Tito's pioneers, you know, and I was deeply, I think I was 10 years old, and I say this in the film when I realized that Tito was actually dead because we were celebrating his presence. He was still hanging on the classroom walls. We were still singing songs to him. So, you know, the kind of community spirit that came from growing up as a pioneer in Tito's Yugoslavia was something that deeply impressed me. So as I say, I was coming uh, to looking at Yugoslavia from a place that was, you know, kind of the deep emotional connections that you have as a child and a kind of very skeptical political point of view. And I ended up deciding that what I wanted to do was not really fall on either side of the debate. Because if you come from Yugoslavia, there's a moment in which, you know, someone will obviously ask you what you think about Tito. And you're expected to take one of two positions, kind of deeply pro-Tito or deeply anti-Tito, you know. And I actually find both that really reductive and felt that there must be a way to carve out a space in which we could analyze all of the complexities, the achievements and the contradictions and the problems that were, you know, part of this Yugoslav project. And my filmmaking really began from that place. Uh, and it kind of evolved. I, I have to say that the deeper I went into the archive, you know, I've now spent almost, almost 20 years working on different aspects of Yugoslavia. Um, talking to many people who were close collaborators of Tito, talking to many historians, many politicians, many artists from, you know, filmmakers from those years, depending on what subject I was treating in my films. And all of that has really enriched my appreciation for the challenge that project represented, the building of a socialist Yugoslavia, the achievements that are undeniable, and then all of the flaws that ultimately undermined it. And so I just feel that it's become an incredibly complex and rich appreciation of Yugoslavia. I feel also, I mean, as you say correctly, it started before Yugoslavia, the idea began before the socialism. It was a kingdom of Yugoslavia at the end of the First World War initially, um, which maybe you could argue the assassination of Sarajevo was kind of successful in that it created a unified country, albeit four years later, but that's another debate. Um, and of course, as you, um, I think also for a lot of people who come from that region, especially those who are sort of more towards the pro-Yugoslav end, they may be looking at Yugoslavia through the prism of the 1990s where everything did fall apart and there was a disintegration because undeniably Yugoslavia, for all of its issues, was very cosmopolitan. And very cosmopolitan, there was different peoples there. And then when you think about the 1990s, it's the disintegration of a lot of communities that were very highly integrated with one another. And I think perhaps that plays a role. Um, also, you do have, particularly in the history of Serbia, a long history of nationalism, you know, bubbling up and then Yugoslavia effectively containing it in some ways and accommodating it in other ways. It's a very complex picture, isn't it? It is. And it's true that, you know, when you when you... When you think about it historically, I was brought up to be, you know, to feel Yugoslav. And as you correctly read in my biography, when I write it, I say I was born in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. You know, it's a part of uh, my identity that, I, that, that is really central to me. And so I was really brought up to believe that this was an enlightened project and that it was a possible project. And that absolutely informs all of the work that I've been doing on the history of, uh, of the country. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And um, this is also where we sort of uh, get to um, when you sort of get to sort of the works of Stephen Labudovich. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit about how you first came across him and, Absolutely. and sort of tell us a little bit about him as well? Sure. I'll just take you back to I had for a long time wanted to make a documentary film about the non-aligned movement. 
in part, this has to do with the fact that I was 10 years old in 1989 when Belgrade hosted what would be the last non-aligned summit of the Cold War. And, you know, as a 10-year-old, I was obviously very marked by the visuality of what we were witnessing as kids. We were taking out of school, you know, to wave flags on the street and the kind of colorfulness and the verve of this gathering was something that I, that I really clearly remembered. And so for me, it's always been something that I've wanted to return to because it was something I wanted to look at more closely, particularly as over the intervening decades, the knowledge of the existence of something called the non-aligned movement has just disappeared from public memory. Most of the time over the last seven years, which is how long it took me to make these films, you know, if people ask me, oh, what are you working on now? And I would say, oh, the non-aligned movement, I would either get uh, a what? Well, you know, a, the what? Or I would get very rarely on occasion someone who says, oh, no one's ever made a film about that. Amazing. It's finally time. So, you you know, there's like the hardcore group that knows and then the rest of the general public that just was never told about. So my desire to tell the story of this movement predates the encounter with Stefan Labudovic, and that actually took place in 2014. I was invited to Algiers to a festival of engaged cinema with my first film, Cinema Comunisto. And I was really stunned by the reaction of the audience to this film because they received it incredibly emotionally. And it shows you the extent of my ignorance that I really did not know why an Algerian public would react so emotionally to Yugoslav story. It tells you how little I knew of the ties that connected to these countries. And because Cinema Comunista won the Grand Prix of the festival the next year, so December 2014, I was invited back to the festival. And that year, Stevan Labudovic was the guest of honor. So it's really kind of in a, in a kind of interesting twist of fate. We both lived in Belgrade, but we met in Algiers. And... I simply asked him the moment he arrived whether I could document his day. I had brought my camera. He said, yes. And I spent a week following Stefan Labudovic around Algiers, continually stunned by the fact that this man was greeted with so much respect and so much honor, even by people on the street in Algiers, whereas we in Belgrade had never even heard of him. And he kind of lived in a very modest apartment with his wife on the suburbs of Belgrade. Just there was such a mismatch between, you know, the, the appreciation that people in Algiers had for the role he was he had played. They called him the cinematic eye of their revolution. And the desire to tell the story of Stavlan Budovic really came from there. What I would realize upon returning to Belgrade and beginning working with him was that because he had been assigned, he was a cameraman of the Yugoslav Israels, and he had been assigned to travel with President Tito in 1954, so the moment that Tito decided to leave Europe for the first time and to sail towards Africa and Asia in the hope of building new political alliances, it's worth maybe reminding people that Yugoslavia was kicked out of the Soviet bloc in 1948. So diplomatically, the country was completely adrift. It didn't belong to the Eastern bloc. It didn't belong to the Western bloc. And Tito kind of trained his eye on the newly emerging third world, essentially, thinking that that might be a place to build new political alliances. And indeed, the story goes that after his first journey, which was on boat to India and Burma, he came back saying the future is, the future is, you know, let's call it the global south. I mean, at the time it was a third world. And I still think this is a positive term to reclaim as a third path. But anyway, um, I digress. Uh, it was upon realizing that Stefan Labudovic, as Tito's cameraman, had captured all of these moments in the first encounters between Tito and Nehru, Tito and Nasser, Tito and Stukarno. So really the coming together of what would become the leaders of the non-aligned movement, that I began to realize that I had found the person through whom I could tell the story that I'd always wanted to tell, which is the birth of non-alignment. And I ultimately ended up making a diptych of two films about Stefan Labudovic, one called Non-Aligned, which really tracks the footage that he recorded um, of the coming together of the non-aligned political project. And the second half of the diptych is a film called Cine Gorillas, which is really about the role Abudovic played in the Algerian Liberation War and more widely the way that a militant cinema was harnessed to the kind of diplomatic efforts um, to win independence from colonialism. So, and the two halves really come together to tell the story of the archives of this kind of extraordinary individual. Indeed, extraordinary he was. I mean, as you've, um, as we're sort of talking about the film, he goes to Algeria, but he goes elsewhere as well. I mean, um, you mentioned to me before we started, he also did stuff with the PLO. And um, before we sort of get on to the main film, talk to us a little bit about the PLO stuff that you're looking at now. 
So Labudovic, I think really just to understand what he was doing, you, you need to understand Yugoslavia's position. You, you know, the Yugoslav socialist government came to power through a guerrilla war against the Nazis. And so it really had this kind of bona fides of, you know, being a successful guerrilla movement in, in progressive in its politics in the sense that it was also a socialist uh, endeavor. And so it's worth thinking about the fact that at the time Tito was seen around the world as, you know, someone who had led his country to independence, um, but also the only leader of the allied forces in the Second World War who was actually wounded in battle. You know, and that kind of people don't tend, tend to think about Tito that way, but it's really worth resituating the perception of him at the time. And so it's only natural to think about the fact that as anti-colonial wars got underway, many of the leaders of these uh, guerrilla movements turned to the Yugoslavs asking for help, uh, asking for their expertise, asking for their knowledge, and then just asking for, you know, help in the sense of arms, weapons, uniforms, and so on. And the Algerian Liberation War, which soon began, maybe became maybe the central colonial war of the 1950s, um, became the war in which Tito would publicly take sides, you know, to the point that France cut diplomatic relations with Yugoslavia once Tito publicly came out in support of the Algerian Liberation Movement. And so Stevan Labudovic is inscribed into this gesture of solidarity and support by virtue of the fact that the Algerians had asked the Yugoslavs for help in propaganda, or rather in counter-propaganda, saying, you know, the French are, are in the media sense are winning this war. They're the ones who are crafting the narrative. The narrative was, these are terrorists, these are outlaws, you know, they're subversive, they're looking to destabilize um, the country. And so the Algerians needed to construct the counter-narrative, which would be, we are an independence movement, we are a guerrilla army, you know, we, there's a kind of political legitimacy to our struggle and really bring their war to a kind of international arena, trying to win over world opinion to their side. And Stevan Labudovic was sent with the very specific task of making a documentary film about the Algerian liberation movement, which would be shown at the United Nations. And with this begins a chapter of Yugoslav cinematic support towards liberation, which would then go on to uh, take form with the work of another cameraman of films, Novosti, a man called Dragutin Popovic, who would go on to make films for Frelimo during the Mozambican War for Independence. And then in 1970, Labudovic would travel to Jordan and enter Palestine in order to make a documentary film about Yasser Arafat and the PLO, which was called Blood and Tears. And so what I've been doing now is obviously, while well, Labudovic passed away, sadly, before I even finished the films about him, but I obviously interviewed him extensively about all of these uh, engagements, if you want, with with political struggles. And so what we're working on now is to shape, shaping this material of the work that he did with the PLO on, on Blood and Tears. Hmm, interesting. Um, so when, for example, going back to Algeria, you had obviously the FLN go to Belgrade and talk to Tito about certain kinds of aid. And part of this aid was this filmmaker, Lubudovic, who goes out. When he sort of goes out to Algeria, what kind of country does he find? Like, on a personal level, how does he sort of adjust to this situation he's in? And how does he sort of think about the reels he's going to create out of it? So, uh, Lubudovic couldn't enter Algeria easily uh, because the French had set up a kind of system of barrages on along the Algerian frontier. And so where he was stationed was in the border area between Tunisia and Algeria, which is where the military headquarters of the FLN, the, of the ALN, the Armée de Libération Nationale were. And so through the interviews I conducted with him, but then also interviews with his comrades in arms who are still alive, the Algerians, uh, you know, who had kind of welcomed him into their units and had helped organize uh, all of the excursions that he took across the frontier to film, you know, the French positions and to film the guerrilla actions. You know, he, he's coming with an incredibly precise mission. So it's incredibly interesting to look at the script for the film and his diaries from the field, because what he was doing was a kind of concerted, he wasn't there, he's not a chronicler of the war. He's there to create the cinematic image of a militant, you know, struggle. And so the kind of filmic language that evolves is incredibly interesting to unpack, you know, the way that he shows them consistently in uniform, 
and he shows them training because the image that needs to be depicted is of a disciplined army, not a kind of ragtag band, band of, uh, you know, outlaws and terrorists. And so what I found incredibly interesting in Cine Guerrillas as a film is all about this, is working with the Russians. I actually had the, the access to the unedited footage that Mabudovic had shot in the Algerian Maki. So to be able to look at the rushes of a cameraman is to really be able to study his handwriting, to really look at the staging of certain scenes. You know, the, there's kind of incredibly... Um, banal practical difficulties. You know, this is the 19, this is 1959. He's working with a 35 millimeter camera, which is an extraordinary thing to take into the Maquis with you because it's a very heavy piece of equipment. But as a result, we have extraordinary footage. The quality of the footage is extraordinary. Most guerrilla actions take place at night. It's very difficult to obtain sensitive film stock. So he has them perform some of their guerrilla actions during the daytime. It's all these things that you begin to, you really begin to and analyze what is a militant image and how it's constructed and then how it serves as a kind of vector of political struggle. So for me, this is all of the things that I was trying to do in Cine Guerrillas as a film. And when, how did the sort of French react to someone like Lobudovich turning up in Algeria? Did they sort of try to clamp down and find a way to stop him? What was the interaction like there? They absolutely do. There is documentation and then just also anecdotal, you know, stories about the fact that once the French became aware that there was someone embedded within the ALN, he, he really became a, a target. He became someone that they were actively trying to take out. And so, you know, the, the whole nature of his work was very clandestine. And this is where the fact that he was Tito's cameraman plays such an important role because the Algerians really saw, you know, Tito had sent them his man and kind of Tito vouches for, and, you know, and then Labudovic, you know, in his own right, is someone who was a partisan in the Second World War and worked in the photographic units of the partisans. So he has his kind of own, you know, bona fides in the sense that he had fought in Yugoslavia's guerrilla war. And, and it is the, by virtue of these two facts that he has incredible access. You know, he's filming meetings of the political leadership. He's filming where their weapons cache is. He's kind of really filming things that you could only really access by having such an extraordinary amount of confidence between the two sides, which is what makes the footage, you know, even more dangerous to fall into the wrong hands, which is why there's this whole kind of system of how he ships his footage via the Yugoslav embassy in Tunis to Belgrade, where it is, where it is, um, the film stock is developed where it is edited and then sent back and internationally. So the kind of the, the struck, the logistics of the whole filmmaking operation are really, really extraordinary. So he's a kind of guerrilla filmmaker in that way. He is absolutely a guerrilla filmmaker. Yes. So um, thinking about what he was sort of trying to do here, well, how did these sorts of reels shape the public consciousness about what was happening in Algeria and what was his sort of intention there? I think they played a tremendous role, and, and the person who kind of testifies to that in Cine Guerrillas in the film uh, is uh, Elaine McTeffy, who was an American activist involved in the Algerian struggle and was working in the Algerians media office in New York. So she's the person in the film who speaks to the fact that, you know, this material arrives in New York. The, the Algerians have set up a diplomatic effort to kind of lobby the UN to pass a resolution in favor of Algerian independence, and more widely speaking, to lobby the UN to pass a re resolution in the favor of decolonization as a whole. And so she really speaks to the fact that images such as these coming out of the Maquis, shaped into a narrative, shaped into a film, which they then show at the United Nations, but also at campuses across the US, you know, to the American media, really play an important role in kind of bringing the conflict closer to the imagination of, the, of an audience in the West and really play an important role in changing the perception of the nature of that conflict. You know, she speaks to the fact that there was four people working in the Algerian media office in New York, vis-a-vis -vis the French who had mounted a public relations operation that engaged around 90 people. So just the mismatch and the kind of, you know, means that they have at their disposal to wage this media battle. And so she really testifies to the fact that it had an Im immense importance in changing international world opinion to the extent to which it became at one point quite simply morally untenable for France to hold on to Algeria. And you see this kind of media strategy. There, there are some fascinating books uh, written by really important historians on this subject. I'm thinking about Matthew Connolly or Paul Chamberlain, mm 
Jeffrey Byrne, who have really looked at these kind of diplomatic revolutions and the media strategies of liberation movements, because ultimately, and this is really worth bearing in mind, you know, France did not w lose Algeria militarily. It lost the war diplomatically. And, you know, we, we can then analyze whether the Vietnam War, the same could be said of the v Vietnam War. So it's kind of really, really interesting to think about the key importance of the media struggle that takes place. So this is a nice place to sort of bring this question up. I mean, there's this idea that truth is the first casualty of war um, and information is often manipulated um, and, you know, suppressed and promoted in certain ways and other cases. Um, and there's always been this sort of pushback in the documentary world that you have to be truthful and faithful to the subject that you're filming and that if something is factually inaccurate or, you know, you take it out, if there's, you can't invent things, it has to be real. Um, how does these sorts of debates sit when you think about Labudovich's films? Um, Labudovich was not a journalist. Maybe I should just draw a distinction there, first of all. Labudovich was a cameraman employed for a film studio that was under the direct political control of the Yugoslav federal government. So, you know, what he was doing, and he speaks about this very candidly, and this is what made working with him in a way so easy. He calls himself a propagandist. He calls the work that he did positive propaganda. But what is undeniable is that these images are, you know, harnessed to a political project. And because I'm a political scientist by education, this is, this is why I find it so um, interesting to work with this material. So, you know, we're not talking about journalism and we're not talking about all of these precepts of journalism that you're absolutely right in pointing out. We're talking about someone who is using documentary cinema in order to further a political narrative. And this has always been, you know, even my PhD was about the use of cinema and the construction of the political narrative of Yugoslavia. So I've always been really interested in examining those relationships, how cinema helps create, you know, how the images create a political imaginary and how they are harnessed to political project. So in this sense, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about kind of propaganda, counter-propaganda. This is a battle of narratives. It, it goes back to, to, you know, that saying of a one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist it's, or vice versa. But it's really this idea of there are different perceptions of the situation who is shaping the kind of narrative frameworks of that situation. And so for me, I found it incredibly interesting to work with Abogodovic because he was very frank about the status of these images. In that sense, there are no truth claims to the images. It's really a claim of my job was to, you know, to help them further their political narrative. And, um, and I don't know, this is, this is really at the heart of the work that I was trying to do within the films. And how do you sort of situate yourself within that? Because, of course, you know, you're now looking at all of this stuff. You're going through his material. You're creating films. Where do you what do you feel about all of this? What is your sort of position on this about truthfulness and so on versus, you know, making films that are positive propaganda, as you put it? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about more about what positive propaganda would be. For me, you know. Objectivity is a word I would never use in my filmmaking. I really think objectivity is something that applies to journalism. You know, I, it's funny, I don't, for example, I wouldn't draw any kind of distinguishing line between documentary cinema and fiction cinema. For me, that is all cinema. But I think there's a very hard line to be drawn between cinema and journalism. And so, and I clearly situate myself on the side of the subjective, the personal, the intimate, the emotional, which is within the realm of filmmaking or cinema. Uh, but are not the, the kind of tools and, and um, if you want, ethics of what journalism is. So we're talking about personal truths and we're talking about subjective points of view. Um, where I position myself in all of that is that I find that in the work that I'm doing, which is very much archive-based, there is a constant need to foreshadow and foreground the constructedness of these images. You know, when Documentary with Cinema was born and named Documentary, one of the fathers of documentary film, John Grierson, wrote, it's actually not a great way to name this. We need to look for a better name because documentary orients people towards the notion of document. Document is proof. Document is evidence. And this is kind of problematic. And there was this idea of, well, let's call it documentary until we find a better word. And, it, and so documentary has been saddled with these notions, which I actually don't think are necessarily applicable. But there is an ethics to the filmmaking. And I really appreciated your use of the word faithful. Because what I'm trying to do all the time is to be faithful to the story. I'm kind of faithful to the protagonists, faithful to their positions, to their lived experiences. And in, in that sense, this is where I position myself vis-a-vis -vis Labudovic. Where I position myself vis-a-vis -vis his archives is that there is a constant work that needs to be done to kind of foregrounding that this is a constructed image 
don't take it as a document. Don't take it for a kind of indexical evidentiary value because it doesn't have it, which is why I spent so much time in Sinegarillas showing you the footage, the rushes of things that they repeat, things that they stage, things where you see that the image is being built. Because I think for me, as someone working with archive and really trying to get that archive to circulate, there is a responsibility to work in parallel on a kind of media literacy, on giving people the tools from which they can understand and read a mediated image as an image that is constructed. You know, someone made this, someone made choices while framing this, someone made choices while shooting this, someone made choices while editing this. Who is the person who created this footage? What was their intention? What context are you looking at this footage in? You know, how do you read? How do you learn to unpick, decipher a documentary image? And so for me, that is where I situate myself and how I position the work. Okay, and when you sort of uh, think about the contemporary relevance of these reels, what do you think they are? And, you know, how what kind of sort of, you know, afterlife do you think they should have now? So the reels need to circulate, first of all. We're talking about material that has not been digitized and has not been indexed. And it, this is not only concerning the Algerian war, it also goes on to the footage that the Yugoslavs filmed for the Mozambican Independence War and in many other places. I feel that... As I traveled uh, to many of these countries where the footage was filmed, I was really struck by the lack of this intergenerational transmission. You know, like Yugoslavia, which suffered this rupture in its political narrative. You know, I grew up in a country where every political change in the system meant an erasure of the past and a kind of, you know, real dismantling of the public memory of the history. This was the case when Tito arrived in power and they erased the existence of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Then the, when the nationalists came to power in the 90s, they erased the existence of Tito's Yugoslavia. You could even say that after our democratic revolution in 2000, Milosevic's Serbia was erased without really any kind of examination of the legacy of that era. And so I grew up in a um, public sphere of memory, which is characterized by rupture, disappearance, and erasure. But what really struck me when I travel to Algeria or even when I go to Egypt, is it's very much the same mechanisms at work, you know, change of political regime, the previous one is erased. And so I find in young people, particularly when I speak to them, a huge hunger for images of the past, because they have not been given access to them, and they have not been given access to the possibility of studying that past on their own terms. And so for me, the first job here would be having these images, images digitized and circulating in order to provide a new generation just with the tools with which to form their own ideas and uh, conduct their own examinations of the past. And then this footage has an additional value because this is really a footage of the construction of a certain political project, one that ultimately failed, you could say, uh, but really I think urgently needs to be revisited because we grew up uh, really you know, I was a student of political science in the late 90s with this kind of triumphant Western um, dominant narrative of kind of, you know, we have reached the end of history. We, there is only one path forward. It is that of Western liberal market democracy, um, which ultimately ended up being imposed globally. And we, I would say as a generation, and particularly the successive generations, were really deprived of any alternative political horizon. And so for me, the real value of these images is not as documents of the past. I'm not a historian. I really see them as seeds for an examination of potential alternative political futures. And I really work with this material as something that is uh, a way to look forward and not a kind of digging up of the past for the sake of, you know, just kind of historiography. This is uh, giving me two extra questions that I feel I must ask now. Um, so the first one, as you're sort of um, thinking about all of this, when it comes to you, uh, you know, because I kind of feel like in a way, when you talk about the past, in a political environment where amnesia is the currency, you know, memory is a kind of resistance. Um, I'm getting this sort of strong vibe here. Um, but also when you start talking about alternatives to Western liberal you know, market capital democracy, you know, thinking about this from the perspective of someone who lives in sort of Belgrade and in Serbia, do you feel Serbia is part of the Western, you know, cultural orbit, or do you feel like it's something else? <laughs> I love that question. Oh, we would need another 15 minutes for that one. But uh, <laughs> um, just to answer your first question, yes, I've begun to realize over time that 
I've spent as much time during the making of my films taking things out of the trash as I've spent filming. You know, my first film was about this derelict film studio that had been the central film studio of Yugoslavia that had produced 50% of all Yugoslav cinema. And that at the time I started making a film there was just this derelict abandoned space about to be auctioned off and privatized uh, with a kind of total disregard for the cultural heritage it represented. And so, you know, in the five years that I spent making that film, the amount of things I took out of garbage cans while I was filming was just extraordinary. And that's really become a gesture for me. This Just this idea that erasure is a form of violence that I can maybe try and resist through my filmmaking and through the kind of gathering. You know, so many times the places I filmed in were the last time someone took a camera through those spaces. The people that I've interviewed, it was their last interviews, you know. And so it, it really became this gesture of, can I play some kind of role in this transmission between generations because the forces that have ruptured it have been so violent? So absolutely, when you talk about, you know, memory work as a form of resistance, I hear you. It's, it's, it's absolutely accurate to how I feel um, my engagement with this work has been. To try and answer your second question, it's a complicated one. Uh, culturally, yes, I was brought up to feel that we are part of European civilization. Politically, I'm very, very aware as a citizen of Serbia being on the outside of the borders of the European Union. That obviously impacts everything from travel to where you can study to where you can work. So um, already there, that is a, you know, that is a complex question to be asked. Um, and then, you know, Serbia's relationship with the online movement itself is a very complicated a question to try and answer because you know because the su successive Serbian uh, governments have distanced themselves from the Yugoslav legacy, it's then difficult to claim the non-aligned aspect of the Yugoslav legacy, except that it is actually a very valuable legacy to to own. You know, um, Yugoslavia had an incredible international stature due to its position in online movement, and of course, you know, the Serbian authorities try and profit from that stature when it's politically convenient to them. So it's a very, very difficult thing to ask. And I find that Serbia currently is unsuccessfully straddling this kind of, you know, three-partite, if you want, position of, are we a candidate to EU accession? You know, are we kind of in, in the Slavic brotherhood with the Russians? Or are we a kind of non-aligned, you know, a, a successor of a non-aligned legacy, which is open to building relationships around uh, around the global south. And I find that rather than kind of really truly managing to position Serbia in a non-aligned, in a non-aligned fashion, I kind of feel that we're failing on all three fronts. I ask this also because it kind of relates to something I'm going to ask in a few minutes, which is about alternatives. Um, because my feeling is with a lot of when you go through a process of Western liberalization, which is to sort of join this sort of club in this orbit, the, for a lot of countries, it sort of entails a kind of amnesia about your own history and past. But we see this not just in Yugosla former Yugoslavia, we see this all over the world. You see this in Turkey, you see this in India, you see this in so many different places that there's a kind of needing to forget in order to join. And if you're living somewhere like the United States is often classed as a country which is very amnesic. You don't remember what happens five minutes ago. It's in the past now. Um, and in a funny kind of way, this is meant to sort of expand your horizon. But I sort of wonder whether it actually isolates you more. Because if you think about, you know, the past in Yugoslavia, this non-alignment block, does this place feel, this Yugoslavia, does this feel more connected to the rest of the world compared to what Serbia is now? Or does it feel more isolated from it? That's a really interesting question. You know, I grew up under a sanction. So the UN imposed sanctions on Serbia, I want to say 1993, and they were lifted, you know, many, many years later. So I grew up, I'll never forget, I was 16, I turned 16. We were all excited to turn 16 because you could buy an interrail ticket. An interrail ticket allowed you to travel around Europe on trains for free, essentially. And there was an interrail map of Europe. And so you have like different colored regions. Like, you know, some countries are purple. That's one interrail ticket. Some countries are blue. That's another ticket. And then Serbia was black. And I'll, that map really, I'll, I'll never forget that map because that's what we were all throughout the 1990s. We were a black hole in Europe. That's how it felt to be living in Serbia. And so 
coming out of that position of really being isolated in the sense that the, you know the airports were closed the frontiers were difficult to navigate you couldn't leave easily you couldn't travel uh, nothing could come in nothing could go out um that was an absolute feeling of, of isolation you know and so for me when i think of what kind of future i would like for this country that's absolutely one thing that's primary in my mind is that we cannot go back to being any kind of international pariah it's just not a position that is tenable I don't know whether that answers that answers your question, but I'd like to try and address another aspect of your question, which, which is this question of amnesia. You know, obviously, I don't think in Serbia we've ever really had, I don't think I know in Serbia, we have never really had a public conversation about the role played by Serbia in the breakup of Yugoslavia. You know, the country was divided at its core over those who are pro-Yugoslav or those who are nationalist and kind of pro and uh, uh, the, the role of, you know, the Serbia played in the breakup of the country, but also in the war crimes. This is, these are conversations that have never really taken place publicly in Serbia. And so amnesia is a kind of general state of affairs. And one thing that I know for sure is that, you know, a, a country without a kind of national consensus over how to tell the story of its national life is a country that doesn't really have a clearly forged identity. Essentially, without memory, you have no identity. And without an identity, I, I find that for me, this is where the essence of the, what I think of as a disorientation in our positioning in the world comes from. Because there's a story that we haven't told ourselves about ourselves, about who we are, where we come from, what has shaped us. You know, we haven't healed any of the scars that have shaped us ultimately. And so it, it is for all of these reasons that I find, it, to, my, to my perspective, we're a country that's very much adrift on the global stage. Indeed. Um, so when you sort of think about now the legacy of the non-alignment block of the non-alignment movement, what do you think that is? And what do you think is the sort of future of alternative politics? There is a profound legacy that is intangible, invisible, and is not really on, uh, if you want, on an official level, on a personal level. When I traveled to India for this film, or uh, Egypt, or Algeria, or even further afield, when people ask me where I'm from, you know, and I, if I say from Serbia, they'll never heard of it, or, or they'll think I mean Siberia. But if I say from Yugoslavia, they go Tito. And it's happened to me multiple times. It happened to me in Mexico. It happened to me in New Delhi, for example, that the taxi driver wouldn't take my fare because he was driving a Yugoslav. And so my point is there is a legacy here. There is an absolute legacy. I've been working a lot. Currently, there is a thousand students from Africa on scholarship in Serbia because the Serbian government has reactivated this policy of non-aligned scholarships that used to be exist in the 1960s and 70s. And I've, you know, I've been doing a lot of work with these students, for example, doing workshops with them, showing them these archives, really thinking about there's a real, like I say, it's intangible, but is absolutely real building of connections and networks on a human kind of individual and to individual level across the global South. And I, I, I really appreciate the fact that all, this gives us a common political language. So when I went, for example, to this film festival in Algeria, we were sitting at a dinner there was a director from Vietnam, there was someone from Mali, you know, I was there from Serbia. And what struck me during that dinner is the fact that we actually we speak the same language. There is a political complicity and understanding because of the way our countries are positioned in the world. And so for me, there is an actual genuine legacy to non-alignment, but I would situate it there. I wouldn't situate it on a kind of interstate, you know, global official political level, but I would, I think in, in the terms of the human connections, you know, the teachers who went from India to teach in Africa, you know, the kind of uh, construction companies from Yugoslavia that went to build uh, in Zambia, all of these connections, they absolutely exist and they have left traces. And I think they have left a potential now arriving at, uh, to your question about alternatives. They've left a potential for some kind of conversation that needs to, to be taking place for a new kind of imagining of what can these um, periphery, periphery, as we would call them in the political science field, relationships look like. There has to be some kind of decentering that needs to start taking place. You know, the conversations cannot be only taking place in London, Washington, and so on. They really need to be taking place in, um, in the countries, you know, in between themselves. So my last question, 
Um, because now we've sort of discussed the sort of internationalness of this sort of non alignment block, and we've also discussed if we sort of bring it back to the early questions of the first questions, which was about the intergenerationalness between you and your mother's generation. You now obviously have students, you have children. What do you sort of see as their future going forward in Serbia? And what do you hope for them? And, you know, is there sort of a difference in what they want compared to what you want? I am incredibly worried about their future. Because, you know, to zoom out, just in environmental terms, I'm worried about their future. Then obviously in political terms, you know, the kind of disintegration of, of the international system, how no matter how flawed it had been, you know, the kind of post-World War II international system, I think what we're witnessing now is its complete disintegration. Which, you know, to my mind is also coupled coupled with the kind of death throes of capitalism. But that's, you know, that's not my personal political perspective. So all in all, I have zero optimism about their future. And but because, you know, because I think everything that has been built, and I think in, in very flawed ways, is crumbling. I actually think this might be a, st- a space that that can create a, an opportunity for complete, a kind of complete redrawing of the political, social, and economic system. So maybe they will, you know, they will have the opportunity to build from scratch. But I think it's going to be a very devastating circumstances. So I'm not the right person to ask. I'm really not the right person to ask because I, I don't necessarily have a very. It's funny. I'm not an optimist, but I am hopeful. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, it does in this interesting kind of way. I feel that um, in many ways your conflicted feelings sort of represent the sort of legacy of the countries and the regions you come from, which is conflicted about itself. <laughs> so you're a microcosm of it in a way. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yes, and uh, it's also interesting, like the death of capitalism, but I'm not a socialist. So <laughs> this is all part of a parcel, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? But this is, I think this is why I was so drawn to the idea to try and tell the story of the third way. You know, I, I really kind of reject and refuse that there must be a kind of for it or against it position, that there must be a third way, you know. And, and I really think that whatever political imaginations can flower, they're going to have to be in this third space. Mila, thank you for talking to us at Memo Conversations. Thank you. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. If you've missed this one, or would you like to catch up with previous ones, you can go to our website. But please do tune in next time for more Memo Conversations. Mm